But this morning, we are going to look at baptism. And so the title of the message is Baptism, Identifying with the Gospel. So baptism, identifying with the gospel. But let's begin this morning uh, with a passage that might not be associated with baptism, at least not at first. So you can look at Matthew 16, and I'm going to read verses 13 through 19. It says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So in this passage, Jesus, he establishes his plan and his purpose for his church and his people within the church age. The church, he mentions, would be established upon a certain foundation. And that was this confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. This the church confesses, that Jesus is God, that he is Lord. And so it's upon this confession that the church would then also, we see, go forth and prevail against the gates of hell. And how would a church accomplish this divine task? Through the power of the gospel, that gospel confession of Jesus as God and Lord. So when the church goes forth with the gospel message, then those that are bound behind the gates of hell can be loosed and come to repentance and faith, confessing Jesus as Lord and Savior. But then in a striking statement, Jesus continues, and he actually gives authority to the church. The church would represent him upon the earth through the gospel, and they would then act with the authority that Jesus gave. So he said in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this is somewhat of a startling statement that Jesus would give authority to his followers. Authority that in some sense even extends beyond the finite physical existence. Now, Jesus first says this to Peter, but the other disciples, the apostles were around him, and they would be those that God would use to go out and establish his church. And we see in the context here, and then we'll look here in a moment in Matthew 18, that the keys of the kingdom are given to the church, the divine authority to represent Jesus. So we look then at Matthew 18. And here is a familiar passage on church discipline. The instruction is given for an individual to confront a sinning believer uh, first privately, and if that doesn't result in repentance, we kind of know the progression, then you take one or two others with you, and if the results are still the same, no repentance, then the matter is brought before the church, the committed gathering of God's people. And then we pick up the instruction, verse 17. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask relating to church discipline, it would be done for them by my Father in heaven, For where two or three are gathered in my name, and that is a church, there I am among them. So here we see that the church holds responsibility to bind and loose or to affirm an individual standing of forgiveness before God. Now this authority is held collectively as a church, not by an individual. Now we don't want to confuse this because truthfully there have been certain denominations and so-called Christians that have taken this and abused this. The Roman Catholic Church claims that the Roman Catholic Church has the authority to forgive sins and even determine an individual's salvation. Basically, if you don't follow their 
dogma and rituals, then you are not saved. And this is heresy. This denies the truth of the gospel. What Jesus is actually saying here is that the church, the local church, has the authority and responsibility to affirm or pass judgment on an individual's spiritual condition. Specifically, an individual who claims to be a Christian. When a member of a church is in good standing, living godly before the Lord, the church as a whole affirms the individual's confession that truly they have a credible confession of faith. They're welcomed, encouraged in all aspects of the church, but when a believer is living in unrepented sin and a church church puts them out of fellowship, the church is declaring that that unrepentant sinner is, as it were, bound or in a state of sin before the Lord and really out of his fellowship and even now out of his fellowship or out of fellowship with his people. So the keys of the kingdom or the authority that has been given to the church is the responsibility to publicly declare or recognize a personal a person's spiritual standing before the Lord. It was not given to a pastor. It wasn't given to the deacons. It was given to the church. The church doesn't create the reality of one's spiritual condition, but they hold the responsibility to recognize and affirm that reality. Now, you might say, well, what does this all have to do with baptism? Uh, I thought that's where we were going, and that's where we are going. But we need this foundation. For the Lord has given to the church not one, but two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Not only as an outward memorial of the gospel, but as a symbol of one's identity with the church and the church's recognition of a Christ follower or a disciple of Jesus. So we can see this even further in Matthew. We go to the end of Matthew, Matthew 28, and here we get to the Great Commission. Verse 18, and Jesus came and came and said to them, all authority, so he's talking about the authority he has, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. And then what does he do in that authority? He says this, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. So those initial disciples who were commissioned by the Lord under his divine authority, were to go out in Jesus' authority and make disciples, preach the gospel, minister, make disciples, and then baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This outward action of baptism, then, would be a public declaration that this individual was a disciple of Jesus Christ. It really was an affirmation that, indeed, this person has professed faith in Jesus Christ and is now a child of the king and united to God's people, the church. So the instruction is given to believers, is given to believers who obey then this commission to together in the life of the church to come together and affirm confessing believers' faith in baptism. So baptism, we could say then, is kind of the first way that the church fulfills her responsibility to affirm and recognize Christ's followers. Now, let's just talk briefly about the Lord's Supper, because prior to Jesus' death, the night he was betrayed, Jesus provided also the ordinance we commonly call the Lord's Supper. We can find that in Matthew 26, starting in verse 26. They were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat this in my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And then he says that he would not drink it again till he returns. But on that night, Jesus, the night that he would be betrayed, he was going to willingly go and give his life as a sacrifice for the sins of people. He was that perfect sacrificial lamb of God, Here he is at that supper, and he took some of the elements of the familiar Passover, which looked back to the Passover uh, in Egypt when God passed over Israel and instead brought judgment upon the Egyptians' firstborn. But he passed over them how? By the shedding of blood. And so it's looking towards Jesus' shedding of blood. So he takes those familiar elements of the Passover and gives them new meaning. 
This now, this meal of bread and wine would be a meal given to God's people under the new covenant. It would be a meal that pointed to the gospel and to Jesus as the sinless sacrifice. The Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the people. He would be the covering. So the second ordinance, though, is for the frequent observation by the church. So baptism comes, you go, you preach the gospel, make disciples, you baptize them. Now you have another ordinance that is a consistent observation of the church. So as churches were formed around believers coming to Christ and being baptized, then they would unite frequently around the Lord's Supper. We read this in 1 Corinthians 10, 16 through 17. The cup of blessing that we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread that we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. So it was a sign as well of the unity that we have in Christ. The Lord's Supper is a sign. We take it together as a sign of unity. Now, if you remember the Corinthian church, they had some problems, right? They weren't really united. In fact, they were using even the Lord's Supper as, a, as an opportunity to promote self rather than unity. If you remember, Paul had been admonishing the Corinthians because they had allowed sexual immorality to run rampant within their church. And he says this back in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 12, about that very issue. He says, for what have I to do with judging outsiders? He's saying unbelievers. But what does he say? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? He says, God judges those outside, but purge the evil person from among you. So part of the church's God-given authority and responsibility is to judge, we could say, the spiritual condition of a professing member based upon their confession and their life before Christ. If a believer is found in unrepentant sin, the church is to, uh, and, and continually so, they can follow the procedures of church discipline, but if they are still unrepentant, then the church is to exclude or remove the unrepentant sinner from the church, just as Paul was telling the Corinthian church to do. They were not even to eat with such a one. Now, that is a reference to acceptance and fellowship, but where is the fellowship of the church most clearly seen and illustrated? It was within the Lord's Supper. That's why he said, because there's one Bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. So it was through the Lord's Supper that the church continues, it is through the Lord's Supper, that the church continues to fulfill its responsibility to affirm and recognize Christ's followers. It's a sign of unity between true and obedient followers of Christ. That's why if someone is under church discipline, they are excluded from taking the Lord's Supper. The church can no longer confirm that individual's confession as credible. So we lay this framework in order for us to clearly see that the ordinances are important in the life of the church, and they've been given for a reason. They've been given to the church as a means of confirming a believer's confession as credible. And they also symbolize the gospel in various ways. Now we won't spend any more time on the Lord's Supper, but hopefully that'll give you at least a brief summary of how the ordinances kind of work together in the life of the church. But let's focus back on baptism. And there's really kind of three spheres in which baptism proclaims the gospel. And the first one is publicly. Now our English word baptize is a transliteration from the Greek and simply means to plunge or immerse. And so in the New Testament, where do we first find baptism? It's the baptism of John the Baptist. We see that in Matthew 3. And here, John is preaching a message of repentance. And those who repented, says Matthew 3, 6, they were baptized by him, by John, in the River Jordan. What were they doing? They were confessing their sin. So the act of baptizing there was an act of identifying with what had happened internally. A heart of contrition. Repentance. They were confessing their sins. But then John the Baptist said this, Matthew 3, 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And as we move into the New Testament, we see that baptism not only identifies with a repentant heart, but also the spiritual reality of being baptized by the Holy Spirit or being placed into, we could say being immersed into, united to who? 
Jesus. Romans 6, the passage we read for our scripture reading says this, Do you not know, starting in verse 3, that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Now, there in Romans 6, baptism is referring to the physical baptism uh, of the Holy Spirit, where we're baptized into Christ. We're placed into Christ. Our life is hidden in Christ. And so at salvation, we are spiritually placed into Christ. That's why Paul continually says, you are in Christ. We've, we, we have received the very life of Jesus. Our old life was crucified, as it says in Romans 6, with him. Galatians 2.20, Paul says this, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but who lives? But Christ lives in me. So we have been immersed spiritually into Christ, completely placed into him. Our life is hidden in his, but our life is also hidden then in his death, his burial, and resurrection. The life we have, whose is it? It's Christ's. And in our unity, there is this, this understanding that because of our unity with Jesus, it can be said that we were put to death with him, that we are buried with him, and that we rose to new life with him as well. And this spiritual reality of the gospel is precisely what the physical ordinance of baptism symbolizes. Baptism is a public demonstration of the spiritual reality of a union with Christ, a union with Christ in his life, death, and resurrection. So when one becomes a believer, when they become a Christ follower, they are to be baptized. That's why it says in Acts 2, 37 through 38, now, when they heard this, the gospel, it was where Peter preached the gospel to those in Jerusalem. They were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. This is often why we describe baptism as the first step of obedience. It follows repentance and faith. It's the outward identification with Christ. And in water baptism, what are we? We're placed under the water, right? That symbolizes our unity with Christ in his death and his burial. We're placed under the water. And then we're brought out of the water, symbolizing our unity with Christ in his resurrection and his life. Colossians 2.12 tells us that we've been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And once again, that passage is highlighting the spiritual baptism of which the physical baptism is a picture. 1 Peter 3.21 illustrates, shows how this illustrates the spiritual reality. He says this baptism, which corresponds to this, and he's talking about how the eight people were brought safely through the flood on the ark. But he says, baptism, which corresponds with this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in other words, the, the washing of the body with physical water, he says, it, it doesn't save. So we want to confuse his usage of save here as saving uh, grace. But he then defines it and says it's an appeal or an outward sign. It's really an identification of faith in God's promise of salvation. So he says baptism showcases what has happened in the heart. So this is how baptism proclaims publicly the gospel. It is a declaration that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried uh, as a dead man, and then that he rose from the dead in life, conquering sin and, and death, and, complete, and being a complete and acceptable sacrifice for salvation. That's why we practice as well baptism by immersion, because that shows, not only is that consistent with the biblical usage of baptism, but it shows, it's a picture of being placed in the grave and then raised to new life. So publicly, baptism proclaims the gospel, but also baptism has corporate implications. And we've already touched on this a little bit, because we go back to Matthew 28, 
and where we're called to go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. So the initial instruction concerning baptism was given to those going forth with the gospel, and it was their duty not only to proclaim the gospel, but then when someone was saved, they were to instruct them and baptize them. It was to be a corporate expression from a church as they, as God's people, would identify with the new believer and be committed to this new believer in the unity they share in Christ. If we look again at Acts 2, verse 38, where Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now, once again, lest we misunderstand and think that baptism is necessary for salvation, we have this clarification. Verse 41, So those who received his words, that's believed his words, they were the ones who were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And here we kind of see the church there in Jerusalem getting underway. So those who respond in faith, then were baptized. Basically, they publicly stepped away from the crowd of God-rejectors and identified with Jesus and then made that public in baptism. But they also identified not only with Jesus, but they also now identified themselves with God's people, the church. It says, and it goes on to say, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. We could say added to the Jerusalem church. They identified themselves with God's people through baptism. So in baptism, then, there is this corporate implication. A believer is stepping out of the world and identifying themselves with Christ and with his people. And the church is identifying them back. So even as we stand as God's people and observe a baptism, we are there affirming that person's credible confession of faith and standing there saying, these people are people that I'm responsible for to love and serve and point to Jesus. So it's a time when the church affirms and recognizes a Christ follower's confession, but then baptism also has spirit or individual implications When a believer is baptized, they are personally identifying themselves with Christ. They're personally affirming the gospel. It's a time when the new new believer uh, or the believer declares the gospel to the world. So Galatians 3, 25 through 27. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. So those who had made a credible confession of faith and were baptized, he mentions they have put on Christ. Identified with Christ because we are in him. We've been united once again to Christ. Now salvation, the moment of salvation, is is often a very individual and in one sense it's it's a private experience where God saves the sinner and reconciles the sinner to himself. However, salvation was never meant to remain private The power of God unto salvation includes the power to transform a life into the image of Christ. And so at that moment of salvation, the sinner is brought into union with Christ, and there is this identification with Christ that could not have been there before. And so we are now called, as 1 Peter 2.9 calls us, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. You are gods. So then the individual who is saved takes the next step of obedience and proclaims that individual commitment to the Lord publicly. Spiritually, they've been put, they have put on Christ, they've been united with him. And so baptism is a renewing, if you will, of their commitment to obeying and following Christ. That's why we also baptize saved individuals only. It's only a believer who can willingly identify themselves with Jesus. And it's a, a one-time event where the individual identifies them with, themselves with Christ, identifies themselves with the church, the church commits themselves to those believers, and then that's why we talked about the Lord's Supper, because the ongoing ordinance or memorial that we're given of showing our commitment to one another and our unity in Christ is then the Lord's Supper. So baptism is a time of joy, 
It's a time of rejoicing in Jesus. It's a time to reflect upon the marvelous salvation we have in Christ. It's a time to rejoice in the unity we have in Jesus. It's a time to renew our commitment to serving God's people. And this is how baptism pictures the gospel. It's really a gift that God has given to his church and to his people for the proclamation of the gospel, for the unity of the saints, and for a memorial to the wonderful, complete, and powerful work of our Savior. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this ordinance, this memorial of baptism. What a joy it is when a believer publicly identifies with you in this way. May we see in it as we observe baptism here in just a few moments, may we be reminded of our salvation. May we be reminded of the wonderful truths that Jesus lived and died and rose again for us. May we also see the commitment that we have to you and also to your people. May it be a time of affirming and confirming faith that we can confidently say that these individuals are followers of Jesus Christ. We thank you for this time and we ask a blessing as we continue uh, in the the baptism part of our service. We pray all of this, though, in Jesus' name. Amen.